In our last video, we spoke about two different models that account for why specific phobias develop and why they continue. Remember, this is called maintenance. In this video, we're going to discuss how these two models inform different types of therapies. So you'll recall from the last video that Maurer's dual process model explains that people can develop specific phobias through classical conditioning. Essentially, the person has had a bad experience and learns that that particular object or situation is scary. The second part of the dual process model explains how their fear is then maintained over the course of weeks, months or years because the person avoids the feared stimulus. This avoidance behaviour perpetuates the fear through negative reinforcement. The person avoids the scary thing and feels better temporarily, so this becomes their go-to anti-anxiety strategy. They learn that avoidance behaviour makes all those bad, scary feelings go away, so they do their safety behaviours more often in the future. The removal of the unwanted feelings reinforces the avoidance behaviour. But the problem with avoidance is that the person never gets the opportunity to learn that the stimulus isn't actually dangerous. This is where exposure therapy comes in. Remember Mary Cover Jones? She was the one that found out that if she allowed baby Peter to gradually get exposed to the white rabbit that he was afraid of, then his fear would eventually go away. Exposure therapy is based on the phenomenon of extinction. The person is presented with the feared stimulus in a controlled environment. This is important to ensure that the event that they're afraid of never happens. For example, say a person was bitten by a dog as a child and has avoided contact with dogs ever since because they're afraid of getting bitten again. In therapy, the person would very gradually be introduced to pictures of friendly dogs, videos of friendly dogs, and eventually actual real life experiences with friendly dogs. With repeated friendly dog encounters, the person would learn that the conditioned stimulus, dogs, no longer predicts the occurrence of the unconditioned stimulus, getting bitten. Well, research into extinction has found that the brain is not unlearning. It's not like the dog equal bite CSUS association has just disappeared. Instead, the brain learns a new rule. The old dog equals bite synapses still exist in the brain, but extinction learning makes new inhibitory connections in the brain. These inhibitory connections work a bit like a roadblock. The brain can't access that old information, so the old fear response doesn't get activated. The neuroscience behind this is obviously really complicated and well beyond the scope of this course, but the takeaway message is that exposure therapy doesn't really make the original fears go away. Instead, extinction learning puts up an inhibitory barrier to stop that old learned association from being active and triggering the conditioned fear response. No activation of the CSUS association, no fear response. Although exposure therapy works really well in reducing people's fears, it's not always the nicest thing to experience. Can you imagine the effort and dedication it would take to show up to therapy week after week, knowing that you're going to be presented with the thing that you fear the most? What if you could just pop a pill and speed up that learning process? Well, turns out you can, kind of. D-cycloserine, or DCS, is an antibiotic that was developed in the 1950s to treat tuberculosis. But in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was found that this drug actually helps learning. In really simple terms, DCS strengthens the learning process so that the person learns these associations faster. In practice, this means that DCS could potentially be used during exposure therapy to facilitate the extinction learning and reduce the number of exposure therapy sessions a person needs. So why is DCS not being used in every clinic right around the world? Well, if something goes wrong during therapy, say the friendly dog is having a bad day and growls, or someone with a fear of heights is taken beyond the height that they're comfortable with. If the person has a significant fear response like this, then unfortunately the DCS would facilitate that learning too. The DCS would actually strengthen the person's fear, not really what we want. 
And given that exposure therapy works so well on its own, DCS is not really something that is generally seen outside of research settings. In the last lecture, we spoke about Beck's cognitive model and how it relates to fear. Remember, this model argues that it's not the genuine level of threat that creates fears and phobias, it's our negative appraisal of the situation that perpetuates that fear. Just like with CBT for depression, CBT for fear and anxiety involves challenging those same negative thoughts and appraisals. So, if you're scared of dogs, you might believe if I leave my house then there could be a dog on the street and they'll run up to me and they'll bark and they'll jump at me and they could bite and that bite would really hurt. So the therapist might get the person to consider all the times that they've ever left their house. Of those thousands and thousands of times they've walked out their front door, how many times have they seen a dog on the street? Like 50 times? And how many of those 50 dogs have actually resulted in bites? One? Okay, so if we look at the situation rationally, the chances of being safe are actually overwhelmingly high. By growing these feelings about the safety of reality, it can bring the person's thoughts and appraisals more into line with reality too, and this reduces their fears. Just as with depression, the therapist might also ask the person to conduct a behavioural experiment where they actually go outside and just see what happens. Did they see a dog? If they did, did that dog bark or growl or lunge at them? And even in the highly unlikely event that those things did happen, what was the outcome? Did these behaviours result in getting bitten and the pain that results? The experience was likely scary for sure, but what was the actual outcome? What was the reality of the situation? No bite. Over time, as the person examines the statistics, it can help them modify their beliefs, modify their schemas, which in turn modifies their appraisals of the situation from scary to not quite as scary as before. The main difference between exposure therapy and a behavioural experiment is that the behavioural experiment asks the person to explicitly test a hypothesis to see if their beliefs about the world are true. And then they seek to challenge these beliefs using the evidence that the person has collected firsthand. Exposure therapy differs in that it doesn't set out to directly challenge a person's beliefs, but this can often be a consequence of the therapy. Thanks for watching. In our final video on anxiety disorders, we're going to look at the second most common anxiety disorder, social anxiety.